So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we are particularly excited this April because we are being sponsored all month long to do a month of climate hangouts by Environment and Climate Change Canada. So we really yeah, appreciate adventure and science into classrooms around uh, the world. So yeah, so we really appreciate their support. Uh, right now, we've got six groups joining us from across North America. So I want to give them a chance to do a bit of a shout out before we dive in. We've got Miss Mervish's grade fours in San Antonio, Texas. Texas. Hi guys. Oh, we had a seventh class just joining us. Awesome. Everybody's here. We have Mr. Tornberg's grade fives in Fontana, California. Hi guys. We've got Miss Quinn's group, ones and threes in Charlotte, North Carolina. Their video isn't on, but they're there and they're excited. We've got Mrs. Wamzong's grade twos in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Hi guys. Everyone loves pandas, I love it. Okay, we've got Mrs. Demi Akos's class, grade fours in Nepean, Ontario. Hi, guys. Hey. We've got Miss Carton's group pouring in, uh, one through six in Anchorage in Alaska. Hi, guys. Hey, and last but not least, we've got Miss Mahoney's group in Charlotte, North Carolina as well. It's a very North Carolina day. Welcome in, guys. Woo! T-shirts. Okay. Uh, of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speaker. So we are joined live at the Virginia Zoo in Norfolk, Virginia, by the team with a red panda. So Stephanie and Emily are going to share a little bit about what they do there with red pandas, a little bit about their conservation, and get us in the pandemonium uh, levels of excitement. So thanks so much, Stephanie, and take it away. So we are live in front of our red panda exhibit here at the zoo. Um, we currently have five red pandas. This exhibit has four. We have a mom and a dad. Their names are Masu and Tamor. And we have her set of twin cubs, um, which are going to be a year old in June. So they're currently nine months old and their names are Freddie and Adam. So they're all kind of up in the tree right now about to take a nap. Um, red pandas are what we call crepuscular, meaning that they're most active in the early morning and late afternoon. So kind of middle of the day like it is right now is when they would take a nap. And these guys are what you'd also call arboreal animals. And that means that they spend most of their lives in the trees. So whenever they go to take a nap, unlike us where it might be in a bed, their best napping spot is way up in a tree. So that's where they're most comfortable at. What's really cool about red pandas is these guys are from the Himalayas. So that is where uh, Mount, what some of the tallest mountains in the world are, just like Mount Everest. And these guys live really high up, about a mile to a mile and a half above sea level. So that's really high up there. And they live in li um, they live where the temperature is pretty stable. It's usually in the 30s um, through the 60s. So they're a good, cold-loving lo animal. Um, and you can tell that by all of their fur. When you see a red panda, one of the most uh, easiest things you can recognize about it is that they're very fluffy. And that big, fluffy is really good for keeping them warm. Um, they also have a big tail that's about a foot and a half long, which is pretty big for their body length because they're only about two feet long in the body. Um, so their large tails actually helps them in the cold weather. If you ever see a red panda asleep and if it's cold out, you'll see them wrap their tail kind of around their body and in front of their face. And that big, large uh, tail helps keep them warm. They also have a really other cool adaptation for the cold weather is that their pads of their feet, if you guys have cats or dogs at home, if you guys look at the bottom of their feet, they kind of have a fleshy pad on their foot. Well, red pandas actually have fur all over the bottom of their feet. And that fur helps them also stay warmer in the cold weather. Another cool thing that red pandas have is that they have super sharp claws. Um, like we said before, is that they're arboreal, meaning that they spend most of the time in the trees. So they need those really sharp claws in order to climb up and down the tree. And no, you're not on that. Push that anymore so this is a little bit more room. They can climb straight down a tree. It's because kind of like us, how our wrists can kind of move in and out. Uh, red pandas can do that too. So they're able to climb down a tree face first. It's perfectly easy for them. So these guys, I'm sure you might be able to see is that there's bamboo in the background here. So these guys are vegetarians, meaning that they really only eat uh, fruits and vegetables and plants. 
so in the wild, um, they would mostly just be eating bamboo. They would eat up to 20,000 leaves in a day, which is a lot, a lot of bamboo. So here at the zoo, we also give them lots of bamboo each day. Um, and we also give them biscuits um, as well. And biscuits are pretty much like bamboo leaves that are kind of ground up together because 20,000 bamboo um, would be a lot to cut down each day. It's really nice here at our zoos, we're able to grow the bamboo so we can give them some fresh ones each day. Um, we also give them fruits and vegetables. We mostly just use that for training. Uh, they contain lots of sugar in them. So whenever we do training, um, such as looking at their body or having them go onto a scale so that we can keep track of their weight, uh, we give them grapes and apples, just a small amount because it's lots and lots of sugar and red pandas aren't really supposed to get a lot of sugar. Just like I'm sure some of you kids at home, you guys, you know, can't eat too much sugar and you might get a belly ache. Um, in the wild, they would also eat some, occasionally an egg out of a bird's nest or maybe a couple of bugs. Um, but mostly they just eat bamboo. Uh, so red pandas each year usually have about one, two, three red panda cubs. And they are born here in North America just in the month of June each year. Um, and they are really cool. Uh, when they have one to three cubs, they have them in a nest. So here at the zoo, we kind of have these little houses here, which would be similar to what they would be doing out in the wild. Out in the wild, moms would go into a big old tree and they would dig themselves out as a nice nest. They would fill it with leaves or any other kind of material um, that they might find. And that's how uh, they would have their cubs in there. Um, these guys are mostly solitary in the wild, but they can live in groups of family groups and zoos. So we do have um, a mom and the dad and the two cubs uh, here at the zoo. So they all get along really well and they'll stay with their parents until they're about a year old. And that's naturally when they kind of go off on their own. So red pandas are really cool animals to work with. Um, they are pretty gentle, so we are able to go in there with them, um, but they're definitely not pets. Um, they are wild animals. They have really sharp claws, so you don't want them to try and climb on you at all. So they're very sharp and could hurt. Um, but we are able to go in there. We can do simple training sessions, like going on the scale or having them stand up and look at their body parts. Um, yeah, uh, sorry. No, that's great. That's marvelous, guys. Um, uh, so let's talk about some conservation with these guys. Unfortunately, these guys are endangered in the wild, um, and that is mostly due to deforestation. So where these guys live, they need lots and lots of bamboo um, in order to eat. Like I said before, they can eat up to 20,000 leaves a day. So when their forests are cut down, um, it takes away their food source. So it's mostly why they're endangered and they're also endangered due to poaching. So people will hunt these guys for fur and also unfortunately for the pet trade as well. And it's really hard to regrow their land. Um, the bamboo that they eat needs to be established for lots of years before it's good for the red pandas. So once it's, the land is clear cut for logging or other reasons or for farms, it's really hard to regrow their natural food source. Um, a really cool conservation um, with these guys is called the Red Panda Network, which does some really cool education um, in the lands where these guys are native to, such as Nepal and China and India. Um, but it also goes out to schools all around the U.S. and Canada, um, and they talk about how red pandas um, can be saved. Um, and they also do a lot of conservation work in the land itself. Um, these guys are really hard to track in the wild. Um, they are hard to find. They have a really cool um, camouflage. So even though that they're red and you might think that they stand out, uh, where they're actually native to, the moss on the trees are red. So whenever they're just asleep in the tree, they're really hard to see. Um, they also have black on their stomach. So if you're just walking around in the forest and you look up, the black on their stomach makes it really hard um, for you to see them. So uh, they're really hard to track in the wild. So these conservation uh, projects out there do a lot of work of trying to find the red pandas. Um, we know that there's less than 10,000 left in the wild, which is 
very small number. So that's why zoos and aquariums all across the United States and Canada um, and Australia are working really hard to spread the message of red panda conservation and to help these numbers um, get better. Outstanding, ladies. Uh, that's great. By the way, I want to highlight how incredible it is to be able to talk 10 minutes straight about an animal, so well done to you. Um, all right, if you guys are okay with it, we'll dive into questions. Uh, you might get a lot of really hard questions. We've got some young kids that are super excited about pandas. Uh, but yeah, if you're good, uh, let's dive in. Yeah, let's go. Awesome. Before we go to our live classes, I want to note too, we have a ton of classes watching on YouTube Live, so if you guys want to type in questions, I know a few classes already are. I will pass them along to Stephanie, so please do. Uh, but yeah, while we're here, let's start with Miss Mervish's class. If you guys have any questions about pandas, come on up. Um, hey, yeah, you're good. To why are the red pandas red? Why aren't they red or why are they red? Why are they red? Why are they red? Why are they red, Stephanie? Why are they red? Um, so it's actually camouflage. So it helps them blend into their environments. Wherever, um, where they live, the moss on the tree is actually a reddish tint, unlike the moss you probably see around your home that's green. It actually has a little bit of a reddish tint to that. So that red color helps them blend into the tree so a predator like a leopard can't see them well. Okay. Uh, let's go to Mr. Torber's class. Great question, guys, to start us off. <laughs> Um, how long do they live? That's a good question. So in general, um, red pandas can live about 10 to 15 years old. Okay. Uh, now we're going to go to, again, Miss Mahoney, Miss Quinn's class, same class. So what we're going to do is uh, go to the video of Miss Mahoney's class. And you guys can take a question. If you have a question to share. How long can it Whoa, that was some epic feedback reverb. I don't know what's going on there. Uh, <laughs> type in the, I don't know why that's happening, but if you type in the question, I'll pass it along, I swear, okay? While you're doing that, let's go to Ms. Wanzong's class and uh, yeah. Ask her. Right there you go. Go ahead. Talk to us. Yep. Why do only red pandas only eat bamboo? That is a good question. So they're just very specialized eat, uh, food eaters. So where they live, there's lots and lots of bamboo, but not a lot of other good food. So they've just adapted over time to mostly eat bamboo because it's plentiful there. Okay. Just like if you live on the coast, you eat fish. If you live in a you know field of grass, you eat the grass. It's an adaptation to what happens to be around. Good question. Uh, the question for Miss Quinn's class, Miss Mahoney's class, is how long can they run? Sorry? How, how long can the pandas run? They how start long can they run? So these guys really aren't made for running. Um, so I'm not actually sure what the answer would be. They're mostly just made for climbing. So they're not really the best on the ground. So they're not runners like a cheetah would be. Okay. Well, speaking of being in the trees, one of our questions online from Ms. Windsor's class, uh, who are first graders in Crystal Lake, Illinois, is do they jump from tree to tree or do they go down to the ground and sort of climb up each one? Or can they jump from tree to tree? They can kind of jump a little bit. Uh, mostly a lot of our trees um, and in the wild, they kind of grow together. So they can go out on very, very small little branches and they can reach for the other branch and they're really good at balancing themselves out. Um, so they can climb tree to tree on very small branches, but if they can't reach it, they'll come all, all the way to the ground and go back up the other side. Okay, great question. Uh, all right, and for the classes that joined in a little late, you don't need to type them in. It's only when you have a tech difficulty. So I'll come to you guys in just a second. Uh, but for now, let's go to Mrs. Damian Atkins' class. Do you have a question? Should be muted, maybe kind of sort of, there we go. Can can uh, can you show us a red panda or like hold one? Can you show us or hold one? <laughs> show us a red panda or hold one. <laughs> oh no! Like I was saying before, red pandas definitely aren't pets, so we cannot hold them like we would a normal, a uh, regular pet. Uh, but they are up in the trees, so we're gonna kind of scoot over a little bit, and maybe you guys can get a little bit better of a view. 
And if you guys are watching at the beginning, we had one walking around in the branches, which was great too. So you get a, you did have a chance to see one at the beginning. Hopefully we can get another view in a second. So they're going to be kind of right up in the tree. And we see two of them right now. And I think it's mom and one of her cubs that are both kind of passed out right up there in the trees. Okay. Well, hopefully they come down and we'll see again, no matter what, guys, you can go back to the beginning and we'll pass along pictures as well where you can see them if they don't cooperate. But for now, let's go to Miss Curtin's class. You guys have a question? Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yep. So, how do they stay cold? Hmm. How do they stay cold in Virginia? Because if Virginia is a place that's warm and they generally live where it's cold, how does that work for them? Yeah. yeah. So here um, we do actually get winter here. Um, so it does get a little bit cold um, and they do love that, especially when, when it snows. So they're happiest uh, during the fall through spring here. And in the summer where it gets really hot, we actually have houses that have air conditioning in them. So if they get a little bit overheated or if they feel a little hot, they can go inside the air-conditioned house and cool off. Nice. The most well-kept pandas in the whole world. <laughs> um, all right, Miss Irwin's class online. So uh, Parker, Colorado, second graders want to ask, why are they so small compared to the other pandas that we know? That is a good question. So red pandas are actually not related to the giant panda. Um, they are close, more, more closely related to raccoons but they're not really related uh, closely to many animals. So the giant panda is actually related to the bears, um, whereas our smaller, uh, the red pandas are actually a little bit closer related to a raccoon, which they're pretty similar in size too. And they make it extra confusing by calling them both pandas just to mess with us. Yes, and actually the red panda was named first. Um, so we call those, uh, they, uh, sorry, so they're, also called the lesser panda, but they were actually named before the giant panda was named. Interesting. Good tidbit. Uh, all right. And then our last class live joined us uh, just after we began. So I'm hoping and expecting you guys are from New Rochelle, New York. Uh, but Mr. Rago's group of Mr. Revise's class, come on up and uh, everybody have a question. Hey, hey. hey. <laughs> come ask a question. <laughs> Why are red pandas red? Why, Why can't they be red? Pandas red. Um, so like we were talking about earlier, these guys use uh, their coloration as camouflage. So the red helps blend into their environment. So it makes it harder for a predator like a leopard to see them. Okay. Awesome. Uh, any more questions online? Let's see. So we've got some from the same class. So we'll come back to them in a minute. We'll start back again with Ms. Marisha's group. Do you guys have a question? A second question, come on up. Don't be shy. No bad questions. Pandas. <laughs> Will the red pandas become extinct anytime soon? So will the red pandas become extinct anytime soon? Well, hopefully not. Hopefully you guys can help with that. Um, they are endangered, like we were saying. There's less than 10,000 left. But there's definitely things that everybody can do um, to help them in the future. Uh, one of the biggest things um, is that their land is getting cut down um, for lumber and trees um, and farmland. So really just recycling and making sure that you're not wasting paper is definitely one way that you can help the red pandas. Outstanding. And so you guys mentioned the Red Panda Network as well in your presentation. So we'll pass along that information to all the classes at the end so you guys can learn how you can contribute on a day-by-day -day basis to helping them, maybe support them, sponsor them, that sort of thing. So we'll pass that on. Uh, and great question. Mr. Tornberg's class, if you guys have a second question, come on up. Do pandas have any predators? Yes, there are a few predators out there in the wild. Um, where they live, there's not a lot of animals, but one of the predators of a red panda would be a snow leopard. Okay. And if you ever get a chance to look up a snow leopard, it's one of the most beautiful animals ever. If you're going to be eaten by anything, it should be a snow leopard. <laughs> um, all right. We got a question written in um, from Miss Queen Miss Mahoney's class, and that is, how do they protect themselves? If a snow leopard comes after a panda, what do they do? That is a good question. 
Um, so red pandas, uh, if they feel threatened um, or backed into a corner, of course, they could always run up a tree. But another thing that they do um, is that they actually stand up on their hind legs and they make themselves look better, bigger. Um, and they make some sounds and they'll kind of pound the ground as well to kind of try and intimidate another animal or scare them off. Okay, excellent. And then one of our questions online for Miss Winter's class again is how long can they sleep? That is a good question. So these guys, uh, because of the food that they eat, which is bamboo, um, doesn't have a lot of nutrition in, at all. Um, so there's not a lot of calories that they're consuming through bamboo. They actually need to sleep a lot. Um, so they're really only active a couple hours a day. Um, and most of that time that they're active is just looking for food. Um, and they spend pretty much all night sleeping and all pretty much from after early morning to the afternoon, um, all during the day they'll spend sleeping. So they're really only active a couple of hours mostly to eat. Don't you guys wish you could do that in your classes instead? Um, awesome. Great answer. Great question. Uh, let's go to Ms. Wandong's class again. Do you guys have a second one? Come on up. So why do red pandas look like fox then it looks like the regular panda we see? Uh. Yeah. The red pandas do kind of look like foxes, don't they? And they also kind of look like um, raccoons. So a lot of people think that they look like a raccoon too, as well. Um, they're related to raccoons, so that's kind of why they're a little bit similar to them. And then the foxes, it's just kind of a coincidence that these two look alike. They're not really related to foxes at all. They just kind of have a similar coloration. Um, another name for a red panda is actually a firefox as well. That is a great name. They should have been called that. Um, all right, Miss Erwin's class wanted to know, uh, you mentioned that they're gentle. Do they know and recognize their handlers? Yes, yes, they definitely know us. Um, we only have a couple of keepers that work with them daily. So there's five of us here at the zoo. So they definitely uh, recognize all of us, especially with the younger ones, because we've been there since they were first born. Um, but they, they are pretty smart. They uh, definitely will recognize their name. Um, and they're pretty comfortable with us going in there. If it was somebody new, they would definitely be a lot more cautious because they don't quite recognize them. And they have a really good sense of smell Whereas maybe their eyesight's not so great, but they can definitely distinguish us all by smell, even if they can't really tell us by eyesight apart. Very cool. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, all right, Miss Demi and class. Yes, hello. When and why did you start work, working with pandas? That's a good question. So ever since I was young, I loved working with animals. Um, so I always kind of knew I wanted to do something related to animals. And when I came here to the zoo to do an internship, I fell in love with working with red pandas and all of the other animals in my section. So I also work with bears and tigers and orangutans. So I really liked working with all of these animals. Awesome. Thank you so, so much. Always nice when we get a question about the presenter. I appreciate that, guys. Um, Miss Curtin's class. Come on up for a second. How fast can a red panda climb a tree? Um, I don't actually know how fast they can run. Uh, these guys really aren't made for running. They're mostly made for climbing. Climbing. Well, that was the question, Stephanie. How, how, sorry, how fast can they climb a tree? Oh, how fast can they climb a tree? Oh, that's good. I'm not actually sure how fast they can, but they can get up there very quickly. They have very sharp claws, so the second they get to a tree, they can just scale it like it was nothing. <laughs> Nice. We'll have to get a speedometer out there, though, and just measure the next time. So our next panda presentation, we will have that answer locked down for you guys. Uh, Miss Mahoney's class wants to try the mic, so we'll try and take two questions from them if they can get it working. Come on up. Let's see if we can do this. I don't think so, guys. Sorry. It's it's reverb. I don't know what's going on, why it's your computers or whatever else, but it's just an echo chamber when we're, we're doing that. So that being the case... Um, I just wanted to pass along one of their other questions. Oh, no, we've taken, we've taken all your questions. Pass along some more, write some more. I apologize for the mic, um, but we'll go to some other classes in the meantime. Sorry about that. Let's go back to New York. Mr. Argos class, you guys don't need to type them. Come ask. Right here this way. Stand in front. Go ahead, ask your question. Yeah. I don't know what your question was. You have to ask it. Oh, how long can pan, how long are pandas when they stand on their hind legs? 
Ooh. That's a good question. So these are about two. Sorry. Tall. Try that again. Sorry, there was the reverb again. Could you answer that one more time? How tall they get? Or yeah. Oh yeah, they're about two feet tall when they stand up. Okay. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Um, all right. Let's see if there's any more online. Oh, okay. I like this question. What's the funniest thing you've seen them do? Animals at zoos are, are, are in, in the sort of behaviors they get up to. Is there anything really engaging, exciting you've ever seen them? Yeah. So, so they're actually super playful when they're younger. So the cubs like to play with each other a lot. Um, and they kind of wrestle. So they'll kind of stalk each other, run out and tackle each other and run around like crazy. Um, especially when they're younger, they have a lot of energy. So it's really fun to watch them play with each other. Awesome. Uh, and North Carolina wanted to ask, how do they communicate with one another, yeah, I guess? Great question. So they do make some sounds um, and they can talk to each other mostly. That's if they're kind of feeling threatened by each other, they kind of make a little grumbly noise. Um, a lot of it's through body postures, like I was saying before, they can kind of stand up at each other if they're feeling a little threatened. Um, and they'll lick each other if they um, are familiar with each other, like the mom will kind of groom her babies. So they don't make a lot of sound, but they occasionally will. Okay. We are whipping through these questions, guys. So what we're going to do is do a whole other round of questions, and then we'll wrap up after that. Uh, let's start with Ms. Marish's class. If you guys have another one, come on down. So, like, if they do, they work. Do are they in groups or are they themselves? If if they are or they aren't, please explain. Did you guys catch that? Um, I didn't quite catch that. Yeah. Sorry about that. Come on back up. I apologize. <laughs> Just speak as slow as possible. Yeah. Are you asking if they're solitary? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. That's a question? Okay. So, do they work? They are solitary, meaning that they like to live by themselves. Um, in zoos, they actually do do well in groups if it's a male and a female or a male and the female and her cubs. Okay. Uh, let's go back to Ms. Tor Mr. Tornberg's class. Um, how do you know when the animals extinct? Like, what's this um, certain amount of animals left in the world when you count them extinct? Endangered. Oh, endangered. Yeah. So they're extinct um, whenever there's none left in the wild. Right. So he, he just he changed the question at the very end. So what's when they're endangered? Is there a set number that makes them endangered? Um, I'm not actually sure how they are considered endangered. Yeah, to, to the best of my knowledge, there is no set number. It sort of depends on the region that they're in and the threats that are facing them. So something's endangered if it's under direct threat. Uh, there are animals that have fewer numbers of them, but they are really, really protected or there's no threats to them. And so they're not as endangered as things that might just be under more threats. A great question. Extinct is zero, though. Um, all right, Ms. Wanzong's class. Come on up, guys. Here you go. Um, how old was the red pit? How old is the red panda that we saw in the picture? Ah. Uh, so in here, we have four. So the dad, Tamar, is five years old. Um, the mom is Masu. She's three years old. Um, and then we have two cubs, Adam and Freddie, and they're both nine months old. Excellent. Yeah, I'm not sure which one was in the picture earlier. It might have been Tamar, who's the dad that's five. Okay. Perfect. Um, Miss Demi Nagos' class. Can they swim? Um, they can't really swim. They uh, would not really go towards water at all. Um, they mostly stick to the trees. I'm sure if it was a small amount of water, they could definitely kind of make their way through it, but they're definitely not going to try and go out and go swimming. I like the thought process behind that question, though, so thank you to that student. Um, all right, Miss Curtin's class. Come on up. Uh, you two. I have two that had the same question, so I'm going to let them come and ask together. How long can they survive? Survive. Well, no, no. Uh, in the... How long can they survive in the zoo or in the wild? Yes. Yeah, so they average, kind of live about 10 to 15 years. Um, in zoos, they definitely live on the, the higher end of that scale, so they're about 15 years old. 
Um, but some of them I, at zoos, I think the oldest was maybe 23. Hey, excellent, guys. We're going to try and get uh, the class with the reverb back one more time. They tried, they've worked with their technology. We're going to see Miss Mahoney's group. Fingers crossed. All right. Yeah. Hey, right. it works. I think we did it. it. Let's do it. Come okay. on. Yay. Hey. Okay. Are you ready? Go yeah. ahead. Um, how high can a red panda climb? Ooh. That's a good question. So I'm not sure on an exact number, but they like really tall trees. So they would be able to climb up pretty much to the top of any tree that they wanted to. Okay. We're going to have to find like a sequoia in California and give them a chance. <laughs> Uh, all right, Ms. Mahoney's class, let's just, you know what, I'm so excited that we got this working. Let's do another. Come on up. Whoa, one more. <laughs> one more, one more. Yes. Yay. <laughs> all right. Speak right there. Go ahead, ask your question. You're good. <laughs> okay. We got one right here. There you go. Lauren, come on. Come on, Lauren. What does the what does the baby cubs play with? Ooh. So that's a good question. Um, at zoos and aquariums, uh, we often give our animals something that's called enrichment. What enrichment is is something that we want to try and encourage a natural behavior in an animal. Um, so here, like I was saying, when they're younger, they are really playful. So when they're young, you want to encourage things like play. So we might give them a ball to play with, and sometimes they find boxes really fun to play with. Uh, but then we also do things that will also encourage foraging. And foraging just kind of means finding their food. So we can put their grapes inside a box, and they kind of have to figure out how to turn the box around to get their grapes out. Uh, we mix up where we put the bamboo, so they kind of have to go and try and find their bamboo each day. So just we want to give them things that will encourage their natural behaviors. Very cool. Sounds like what kids used to do in like the 1890s before like Fortnite and Minecraft. Um, all right, Miss, uh, let's go back to New York. One last question, guys. Come on up and uh, wrap us up. Okay. What is their natural habitat? Huh. Their natural habitat. Yes. Yeah, so these guys live in forests in the Himalayas. So they live really high up, um, about a mile to a mile and a half off of sea level up in the mountains. So their natural habitat is a dense forest filled with bamboo and trees. Um, and it's also where it's pretty cold. So their average temperature is usually between 30 and 60 degrees. That's Fahrenheit for the Canadian class. It's really cold, <laughs> just so you know. But most American classes, so that's good. Um, right, <laughs> ladies, before we wrap up, is there any last message you'd like to share with us about pandas, how people can learn more? I will pass along the Red Panda Network information, but is there anything else you want to share? Yeah, so I definitely encourage going to the Red Panda Network. They have some really cool information that is definitely age appropriate for different school levels as well. And I'll talk a lot about different ways that you can help um, save the Red Panda, different conservation projects, and just different ways that you can even engage your own community about Red Panda conservation. Very cool. Thank you so, so much. I want to note to our classes, too, not only will this hangout go straight to YouTube, but we've done a large series with the Virginia Zoo, mammals, birds, insects. So if you guys are interested in what they're doing there, go check those out. There's a really great list of resources. Um, and so now that we're wrapping up at the end of every hangout, what we do, uh, and boys and girls, if you guys could get ready, I'm going to demute everyone's microphone. And so if you guys could join me in saying a huge thank you to the team at the zoo. Everyone is demuted. Go for it. I love the enthusiasm, guys. Thank you so, so much to all our classes. Great questions, great enthusiasm. Stephanie and Emily, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure having you. And uh, yeah, we look forward to having you back soon. Awesome. Thank you guys so much.